This is EDUC 4703U, Teaching and Learning, Problem-Based Learning. And the title of this video clip is Theory and Structure of PBLOs, Part 7. This is the final um, video clip in this particular series. The analysis questions for this video clip are as follows. What two constructs are used to define the learning object domain? Number two, what is a guided discovery tutoring system? Describe an example. Number three, what is a micro world? Describe an example. Number four, what PBLO characteristics are used in their placement in the grid quadrant formed by the intersection of micro worlds and guided discovery tutoring systems? This slide is a repeat of the initial slide from the last video clip. It's repeated here to provide context for the ongoing discussion regarding learning object landscape or domain that is being discussed. I will repeat the definitions that we are using for learning objects as well. Learning objects can be found in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Typically, they are characterized as small, reusable digital learning resources which support learning. The definition here also includes larger environments that were designed for similar purposes. Learning objects can be classified then on a grid created by the intersection of two constructs or ideas. And as shown in the graphic displayed on this slide, one of these constructs concerns the control of the learning enterprise, that is whether things are under teacher's uh, control or under student's control or somewhere in between. And the second is oriented around the process content dichotomy, that is whether content is central in terms of the purpose of whatever is being done, the activities that are being um, used within the, the learning system, or is process more important than the content. These two constructs then form the axes of the grid. The remainder of this video clip is devoted to a discussion of the characteristics of guided discovery tutoring systems, or GDTS, microworlds, and where PBLOs fit within the scope of the learning object domain. Mark Elson Cook in 1990 described guided discovery tutoring systems where the system acts as a facilitator, guiding the learning adventures of the learners. The focus of the system is primarily on ways of assisting discovery learning, the generation of hypotheses based on empirical observations, within rich content areas. The system attempts to relieve the demands on the official guide, the teacher, the instructor, by introducing experts into the system through drawing on a wider community of learners. The community of learners concept was built into this instructional program from its inception. The goal is to create a learning environment that takes advantage of and encourages distributed expertise within the environment. In their learning community, members each have expertise in different content areas related to a content uh, subject. Each member of the learning community is responsible for sharing their expertise with others and for seeking out others whose expertise can further their own understanding and knowledge. And that's taken from Brown and Campion 1994. Guided discovery tutoring systems are usually presented to learners in a simulation type computer program. You might think of the commercial products SimCity, SimEarth, Roller Coaster Tycoon programs as examples. At a high level, the learning process to be used is implicit within the system. The same can be said for the problems. For instance, in the SimCity program, Learners' users are given the task of developing and maintaining a city. This task is, in many ways, ill-defined and ambiguous. It is up to the learner user to determine the solutions to the problem, although there are restrictions with respect to how the learner user may proceed. Uh, for example, the land must be transformed using a bulldozer before any buildings can be built, etc. Moving next to the microworld idea, Seymour Papert in 1980 describes a microworld as a small but complete version of some domain of interest. People do not merely study a domain in the microworld, 
they live the domain, similar to the idea that the best way to learn Spanish is to go and live in Spain. Microworlds can naturally be found in the world or artificially constructed or induced. A child's sandbox is a classic example of a natural microworld. Given buckets and a shovel, the sandbox becomes a volume and density microworld for the child. In contrast, artificial microworlds model some system or domain for the user. Probably the most well known computer example is Logo, L O G O, a programming language in which the computer models a variety of domains, such as geometry and physics. And this is uh, taken from Papert's work in 1980, but also again in 1993. Other examples include and you may have come across these in classrooms, um, in uh, high school, etc. Geometry Sketchpad and Interactive Physics. Of course, even a natural microworld can have artificial elements. A parent or child could intentionally structure the child's sandbox in some way, such as providing buckets of special sizes, for example, each doubling in volume, in order to increase the likelihood that the child might discover some underlying principles or relationships. At first glance, Computer-based microworlds are often confused for simulations. However, microworlds have two important characteristics that may not be present in a simulation. First, a microworld presents the learner with the simplest case of the domain, even though the learner would usually be given the means to reshape the microworld to explore increasingly more sophisticated and complex ideas. Secondly, the microworld must match the learner's cognitive and affective state, their feelings. Learners immediately know what to do with a microworld. Little or no training is necessary to, to begin using it. Imagine first training a child how to use a sandbox. In a sense, then, it is the learner who determines whether a learning environment should be considered a microworld, since successful microworlds rely and build on an individual's own natural tendencies toward learning. It is possible for a learning environment to be a microworld for one person, but not another. This is all taken from Reber 1996. For a richer description of microworlds, you could start with the logo page in Wikipedia. There are several downloadable versions as well of logo available on the internet these days. These include variations of the original logo such as FMS logo and I'll be giving you the uh, URL for that particular um, language in the WebCT version of this course. There are other versions such as Star Logo, and again I'll be giving you a URL to go and take a look at that as well. Star Logo includes sprites and then derivations or derivatives of the original microworld concept. And then there are other versions as well, such as Boxer, it was created by um, a student of um, Seymour Papert. All of these microworlds share common characteristics noted above, which can be restated in common terms to this course. No learning process is implied in the environment in that the learner user is free to use the environment in whichever way is desired, while observing the built-in constraints of the microworld, of course, and no problems are posed within the environment. This implies that the learner user brings their own experiences and or problems to the environment. So then, where do PBLOs fit within this entire scheme, moving from simple learning objects that are content-centered through to teacher-driven types of systems, which are um, exemplified by intelligent tutoring systems, or process-centered systems that are exemplified by the guided discovery tutoring system, the GDTS, or perhaps a micro-world type of environment. PBLOs can be classified as learning objects as they are relatively small and reusable digital learning resources. Since the content of a PBLO is intended to serve as an instigation for discourse rather than delivery of content, it can't be classified as a simple learning object. As the locus of control in PBLOs resides primarily with the learner user, and since the problems are not embedded within the PBLO but are determined by the experiences brought by the learner user to the context that are described, PBLOs can also not be classified along with the intelligent tutoring systems. PBLOs do have several characteristics in common with both microworlds and guided discovery tutoring systems in that PBLOs are learner-user that is student-directed and they are also process-centered. 
However, PBLOs do not feel, fit well into either of those classifications when taken separately. PBLOs do not conform to the definition of a microworld in that, while they could do provide a learning environment, they do not present the simplest case for the domain, and they do not necessarily match the learner's cognitive and affective states. In fact, PBLOs are designed to challenge the preconceived notions that the learner user brings to the PBLO. In other words, the learner user is able to identify a problem or problems that exist within the context of the multimedia case, and together with others in the community of learners, they begin to explore ways of providing solutions to the problem or problems. A further discussion regarding the model of constructivism referenced here will occur in a later video clip. In a similar vein, PBLOs present contexts within which problems may be identified. This is similar to the characteristics found in GDTs. There are fundamental differences between PBLOs and GDTs, however, in that the learning processes are suggested with respect to proceeding through the four-page structure, but the actual process to be used will ultimately be determined by the learner's users in the community, depending on how the problem or problems are identified and the solutions which will be created. Positioning PBLOs in the quadrant formed by the intersection of the process-oriented and student-directed seems to be the best placement for these types of objects. The theoretical basis for learning objects then that are referenced in this particular video clip are as follows. I'd like you to read the linked papers and they are given by Brown and Campione 1994 and Reber 1996. And again, both of these will be referenced um, in the WebCT version portion of this course. The synthesis questions then for this video clip are as follows. Number one, the learning object domain is referenced by two axes. Why were these two scales used to characterize the domain? Number two, identify an existing example of a GDT and specify why the example contains the characteristics of a GDT. Number three, define microworlds in your own words. Why are microworlds considered to be learning objects? And number four, why are PBLOs considered to be student-directed and process-oriented?